So I tell myself the story. I'll get back to that later when I get back to my office about three o'clock and I'll sit right down and I'll do it. And I would would tell myself that story like I believed it. But you know what? When I would challenge it, it was just a story. It was just a story because three o'clock would come along and I wasn't in the mood to do that. ADHD Rewired, episode 88. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. I know how much you like to plan ahead. It was a joke. If you're interested in the ADHD Rewired Winter Coaching Group, you can let me know at coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. We begin in January. Today's podcast is brought to you by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Check show notes for link. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here with my guest, Robin Nordmeyer. She has ADD herself and has been actively helping others with the challenges of their ADHD for over 20 years. She founded her coaching practice, Life Ahead Coaching, LLC. Five years ago, when she started coaching adults, parents, and youth, She, like many other coaches, helps others find their strength and figure out what's right for them and helps them figure out those discoveries that are essential to help them manage their ADHD. And I'm really excited, Robin, to have you on because I know that you are going to be speaking at this year's CHAD conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, the title of your presentation is The Art of the Start. The Art and the Start, The Win and the Finish. Yes. Okay, so is there anything about your introduction that I missed that you want to fill in? Well, no, I, I think that's great. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks for letting me be here today. Well, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We're, we're glad to have you. So Thank procrastination you. is clearly a topic that is near and dear to, I think, all of our, the listeners um, because it's something that we mm-hmm. often struggle with. And um, so mm-hmm. let's just kind of start right there. So you're going to be presenting on uh, on procrastination at the chat conference mm-hmm. and tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about what you're going to be uh, talking about and what we're always interested on in, um, in the podcast is to hear kind of your story and kind of how you mm-hmm. got into this. So yeah. let's maybe start Robin with, with your story and the story of your, of your diagnosis and um, sure. learning kind of all of that. And then why are you focusing on procrastination? Sure. Great. Thanks, Eric. Well, I'm that classic case. So ADD had no idea that that was what I was going through. I'm very smart, very capable, um, but knew something was off in life. You know, it was just things were always sometimes just a little bit out of my grasp or I would fall just a little bit short of what I was aiming for. Um, some little struggles here and there. My um, kids have ADD. And when they were diagnosed, I'd say that was kind of the start for me. I had to figure out what to do to help them. Um, I got involved with Chad a long time ago, about 2008. I became a parent-to-parent trainer. I've done so many trainings since to help other parents. But most Robin, important- will you talk a little bit about parent-to-parent training? Yeah, yeah. So parent to parent training is really about other parents who've been through this, done this, um, have learned the basics, the fundamentals, um, and some approaches and strategies that really work for other parents to push through the struggles that they're having, the frustration, the overwhelm, all that, and to create some success for their kids. And it's not just about academics either, because we both know that um, we struggle in more than one area of mm-hmm. life with ADD. So um, it was really fun and I really enjoyed it. So it would be behavior, it would be academics, it would be um, relationships, um, household order, all those things in parent to parent were just wonderful for me. Um, and it was my big aha 
And so seriously, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I think that's the saying. And definitely I was learning about this and going, you know what? This is too familiar. This is me too. And that was uh, kind of when it all started. And I went to go get evaluated and they said, no, no, no. Well, what I didn't realize so much is women are a little different Mm -hmm. than men sometimes and they can be overlooked. So I was officially diagnosed at 50. So um, for those that are getting diagnosed late in life, I just want you to know, hey, there is a lot of great things waiting for you when you get diagnosed. It's just a whole different world once that um, gets established. Um, So after making the connection, I started to connect the dots in life. And I uh, was a very chronic, chronic procrastinator. That's why the subject is so near and dear to me. And um, probably had a little anxiety, too, because overwhelm, I remember all the way back from um, those days of being young. But, you know, for procrastination, for me, it was pile ups with clothes, with kids' papers, my own paperwork at work. It was um, leaving things out of place and then having a big mess all around. Um, if it, Getting out the door was a thing about procrastination because it's one more thing-itis, or it was just having a hard time getting into that routine that I knew I had to do in time to get out the door on time, right? We've all been there, I think. So exercising, housework, I was a chronic procrastinator. So uh, sometimes it's hard to start with procrastination. Sometimes it's hard to persist. Uh, We run out of steam Mm -hmm. and then we can't finish, you know, hence lots of projects, lots of big, wonderful ideas that just never quite make it for us sometimes. Um, So what I love to do, I did really well. What I disliked or felt was boring, I would lose some steam. Um, But I knew there was a cost. So um, something had to change. What what was the cost for you? Oh, my goodness. It just depended on what it was, Eric, that I was procrastinating with, you know. So uh, probably the big uh, cost that really, really said, you know, something's got to change is um, it was with work. Uh, I hated expense reports, right? And I just got myself into some big trouble with expense reports where big balances were due, reports weren't in. Oh, it was just scary, you know, and we worked our way through it. But then it was just the big eye opening, you know, something's got to change, Robin, you have to be aware. And I think that was the moment of change. That was the pivot for me. It's like, this is going to cost you your job if you don't pull it together. And everybody knows we need our job. We need our career. I had a great career, very successful. And to have to lose something like that because of procrastination, big cost for me. Mm-hmm. So um, so I had to step back. I had to get my head around this whole thing about procrastination. And, um, you know, I started connecting the dots, like I said, and it was just really about the why. Why? 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 And That's my just, favorite question. Yeah. Yeah. Why? And not why me? Not why me? I, like I wasn't that going to be the victim. It was about why is this hard? The curious why. Why am I dreading this? Yeah. The curious why. And um, why? What am I afraid of? You know, what, what is so bad about this that I can't start? Where's, what's the emotional connection leading me back? And so your discoveries um, were what? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of whys. So what did you uh, discover? In my talk, it, it's going to be about that too. Um, and so I found a lot of different triggers for me. So um, the trigger, of course, boredom is a big one. It's hard. You know, if I was passionate about something, if I loved it, on it. And I was on it. Nobody had to um, get me started. But if it was boring, like numbers in an expense report, for example, you know, that's not very fun. That's not, I'm creative, right? I love Mm -hmm. excitement and I love energy and um, big ideas and numbers weren't big ideas to me, right? Numbers weren't very creative. Um, So part of it was the dread. Uh, You dread, 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 then, then you don't do you know, um, until you get an, um, like what would get me out of dread is the fact that, oh, I got a deadline, 
my, we'll go back to expense reports. My boss expects me to have that expense report Mm -hmm. in or else. So to save face and to get it in, it was in, right? So, or I have friends coming. I have family coming for Thanksgiving. If it was about the house, which housework is boring to me, right? Then it was about do that. I have to get my house clean. And my husband and I would be working like crazy for two days just to get my house beautiful again for company and get the clutter back, everything where it needed to go. So um, urgency, urgency driven uh, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, if there was an emotional connection, I really just had to kind of um, spend some time with that and reevaluate, you know, am I thinking this right? Am I, am I looking at this in a healthy way or do I have to step back and really challenge um, my emotions about something or my beliefs? You know, sometimes limiting beliefs hold us back and we procrastinate around that. So, How did you get through that part of it, the, the, the limiting beliefs? Yeah. So um, the thing about limiting beliefs is I'm kind of naturally wired to challenge them in the first place. Um, You know, it's funny when I became a coach, my mom uh, said, you know, I think that's been you ever since you were four. Right. You know, and and the way I've showed up in life with family, with friends, with situations, you know, it's like, yeah, can do. Don't tell me no. I can do this. Right. I'm wired um, for um, persistence. Naturally, I'm wired to believe that I can do stuff. You know, I'm wired to believe that there's another perspective. I have a lot of empathy as part of my ADD and looking at things from all sides is something I'm naturally gifted to do as, as part of my I do ADD. see that with a lot of people with ADHD yeah. is that ability to, to extract from a lot mm-hmm. of perspectives and see and make connections that, that maybe aren't entirely obvious to, to everybody. So let me ask you this. So I, I know even in your introduction, and I, I kind of read it as, as you wrote it, um, you, you refer to yourself as having ADD. And yes. so I'm always curious um, for, with ADHD coaches, um, mm-hmm. is that an intentional choice or is it like a more of that like habit piece or is it like you have a hard time like identifying as ADHD, as having ADHD when you don't view yourself as, as hyperactive? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't think it's an intentional choice, Eric. I think that... Um, it's just a big time saver. Just let, let the H go and it's... <laughs> oh, I know. I and, and I type things all the time, AD slash HD. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, it's not an intentional choice. It was what I was officially diagnosed with is the inattentive type of ADD. Mm-hmm. But also, the thing about me is I was always on the go, like a motor running. And we know, we know that that's really more about the hyperactivity component. Mm-hmm. But as we get older, we get that a little bit more under control. Um, we're really more about fidgeting and using our fidgeting to move um, as adults when we have ADHD. So I'm not sure if ADD or ADHD is really the right diagnosis. Um, everybody I work with is so different. So I don't mm-hmm. really get caught up in which type of you are, are you of the three subtypes, right? Is an ADD and attentive or mm-hmm. hyperactive? Well, or and now it's, the, it's, it's called presentations because we know that as you were yeah. just mentioning that, you know, they, it, as you get older, uh-huh. um, you know, the, these, these, um, what they used to call subtypes, we know that they're not, uh, they're not static. They, they actually can change mm-hmm. and often do change. Um, which is, you know, it's interesting. Um, and I think, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of on both sides of it where I think cause I typically refer to everything as ADHD because that's what it is medically. Um, and that's what the, the clinical mm-hmm. kind of criteria is. So, but it's also strange to think that you can have ADHD and not have the H component of it, but it's still ADHD. So, mm-hmm. you know, so I, you know, I'm, I often wonder, you know, how much of that is just a choice how that when people describe it and use it Mm -hmm. how much of it is just you know like people who are like experts like thomas brown you know he still uses add sometimes so it's like Mm -hmm. you know and he says he's just you know old habits die hard and you know that's what he kind of grew up in his training learning Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. so just i wanted to kind of bring that as a point because i think it's important that we're all kind of talking about the same thing Mm -hmm. you know as part of the education of understanding adhd 
Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I did, boy, I was definitely the one who had to fidget to focus. I remember in fourth, fifth grade, I used, I was in tap dancing. If you remember that, I used to do little shuffle, shuffle downs, whatever, under my desk while the teacher was lecturing, having no idea why I was doing that, but it helped me. Right. I, I can very much relate to that. I used to, uh, <laughs> I used to play entire piano like pieces on my desk. You know, it was just oh, like my fingers were moving yeah. and I could yeah. hear it in my head. I I have no idea what the teacher was talking about, but I was playing something amazing there on my desk. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. And and I I drew elaborate designs in the sides of my paper long before Fidget to Focus ever came into play, right? And that's that's, that that's a book. Stuff. That's uh, Yeah, I know. Yeah. Sarah Wright. And mm -hmm. um, who who did that with Sarah? Do you remember? Right I do not remember. Yeah. I don't but even I think I realized that Sarah elaborate. Wright was one of the authors for that. I mean, I, I definitely know the book. Like I've heard of the book. I've not read the book. Yeah. Um so, well, okay. I might be wrong. We might have. <laughs> <laughs> Could be com someone completely different. I don't know. Oh, dear. Okay. So I, she's not the only one with that book. So. Okay. So speaking of uh, procrastination and staying focused. Um, mm -hmm. So let's bring it back to that procrastination. I know one of the things <laughs> that, you know, you talked about how you struggled in college and um, and that you you describe, you know, some of the, the key points of what you do with helping um, your, your clients and what you do for yourself is mm -hmm. the importance of focusing on that kind of that metacognitive awareness and mm -hmm. just being mindful of what you are doing. Will, that, will you just talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So just to be clear, um, how working maybe with college students who I work with and how I help them with getting started, sticking with it, uh, that mindfulness about what they're doing and their metacognition. Yes. So um, actually, when I work with students, I I uh, teach them several steps with each part of um, getting ready to do my work, doing my work evaluating my work, which I feel is very much a part of being mindful and um, uh, monitoring ourselves in the moment, right? And like how that. we're doing. So um, they have a series of questions that they were thought to think about. So uh, I, I'm a true believer. It's not always about just teaching a routine or rhythm. It's teaching them how to think about the things they need to do and think about how they're doing and think about how it went. Right. So That's I really focus so on incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I like those three things. And it was, and I'm wondering, so I'm making some connections because this is kind of what our brain does. We're like, wait, I heard, mm -hmm. that reminds me of something and that reminds me of something. And now I'm connecting yeah. these pieces together. <laughs> Don't um, get us going. Right. So <laughs> yeah. I think and I could be wrong, but I think that Sarah Wright may be presented at a social thinking conference, and mm -hmm. she may have been the person who I heard uh, first say when, when she was talking about teaching kids executive functioning skills, she mm -hmm. talked about there's three parts to play, and mm -hmm. it's the setting it up, playing, mm -hmm. and cleaning mm -hmm. it up. And when we think about the fact that, you know, play is a, is a child's work, you know, mm -hmm. we can easily kind of translate that into our work. The mm -hmm. three parts of doing any task is setting it up, mm -hmm. doing it, and cleaning mm -hmm. it up. So it occurred to me when I was listening to this episode that the person's name I was thinking of is Sarah Ward, not Sarah Wright. And she has a great website. You could check it out at cognitiveconnectionstherapy.com. Back to the show. Yes. And so I think we often forget the the mm -hmm. third step. You know, we mm -hmm. give it to, we give ourselves enough time to to do the work, and then we got to run and go, and then we wonder why the piles form. It's because uh -huh. we forgot step three. <laughs> we do, yes, yes, and and so the more you can get a handle on that, boy, it sure does work out a whole lot better. But it's so true with respect to like the things when I work with uh, students in particular. What did they do? They they forget to turn in their homework. They they do all this work, but then it never lands in the teacher's um, inbox, right? Um, they uh, will maybe they set up for a test by studying for a test, and then they're taking the test, and you teach them ways to kind of work through that based on how they're wired. But then actually evaluating, how did that test go for me? What did I do that worked really well for me here? 
Um, what might I try a little differently next time? So mm -hmm. part of that whole mindfulness piece is, is learning from the experience. And I think Ari Tuckman talks really big about this is bringing things from the past into your future and using them in the future. Right. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and I love the, and I forgot who first said it, but the idea that, you know, people with ADHD are, are very experiential learners. The only mm -hmm. problem is we have a really hard time learning from our experiences. <laughs> I don't remember who said that first, but I, it's so true. It, it does take time, but once you get the hang of it. And um, it's not just it the, really the negative consequences, difference. but it's also the, the positive ones too. It's like if something worked mm -hmm. well, you know, mm -hmm. I, what it's so interesting to me is when I'm working with clients and Robin, mm -hmm. you, you, I imagine you probably have the same experiences when, when you have a client that does well with something and you ask mm -hmm. them, well, what, what can you contribute to that success? It's mm -hmm. like a deer in headlights. They, they don't know. It's, and sometimes it's like they, they yeah. attribute it to luck. Yeah. And it's like, no, you did something. Like, what, how did you, if, it's, if they're studying, they, how did you mm -hmm. study? What, what approaches did you take? What did you do differently? Mm -hmm. It's because if we don't, if we're not, you know, really analyzing and breaking down what did we do, then we're not going to know what, if what we're doing is working or not. Right, right. It's such a key question, Eric. What contributed to your success? It really is. And um, as a strengths based coach, it's, that's that's just so important. It's like, what do you do better than anybody else? How do you approach things where you are just like a rocket? So I do have uh, a question. Uh -huh. Is there such a thing as a weakness based coach? Uh, well, you know, we start with the strengths. So I do. And then uh, we try to find where the gaps are in the bridge. And, and um, so executive function is huge. Uh, it's really inherent with ADD that you're going to have some challenges around executive functions. It's just they, they go together, right? And so you start with the strengths because when someone walks into my office, they're usually beaten down. I have heard over and over again, well, I'm doomed. Well, I just can't win. Uh, why should I try? You know, all this stuff that they've gone through has really taken, they've taken a hit with, with respect to their se sense of self, their uh, confidence, their esteem, um, what their motivation levels are doing for them. So you have to start with strengths. You have to focus on uh, what's right. I, I use the phrase, shine the light on what is right with parents I all like the time. Shine the light on what yeah. is right. That's good. Yeah. When you do that, and, and especially kids, you know, I'm kind of jumping between different age groups here, um, but it's true for adults too. And I think all this stuff, I mean, it's, it's interesting because when I, you know, I run a chat group and, and mm -hmm. when I talk about it, I don't really differentiate so much between stuff for kids and stuff for adults because it's just different tasks, but like yeah. the challenges are kind of the same. Right. Right. They are. They are. It's just what level are you um, developmentally? What age? What um, phase in your life are you working with? Um, so you shine the light on what's right uh, as a way to build them back up and, and to say, hey, yeah, there's a lot of great things here inside of me. And uh, to kind of try to get things going so you feel like you can try again. You feel like you can do things. It is inherent. Um, you know, executive functions get in the way sometimes when there's a deficit in executive functions. And so when you find those gaps, uh, there are some things you can do. You can find some strategies that might help you get around them. You can find apps. You talk a lot about technology use and apps that can really help in a lot of these areas. Can you, can you well, get uh, specific with us and, and really help us with either identifying the type of, like what types of procrastination tendencies or, or behaviors do you tend to see? Because I know that not all procrastination is the same. Um, no. it, it kind of roots yeah. in a lot of the same thing. So um, mm -hmm. what are some of like the, the, I don't know if there's you have like a list or, or like the top types of procrastination you see? Cause mm -hmm. I, cause I, cause if we can identify the nature, the core of the, of the, the procrastination and you talked about mm -hmm. limiting beliefs as being one of them. Um, mm -hmm. but what are like, so, you know, it's like we can, if we can have a problem with, with. Um, reading that can be for a lot of different ways or reasons. Mm -hmm. So the strategies that we that we uh, um, use are going to be different to address the problems. 
Mm-hmm. So what are the like the most common forms of procrastination that you see? So when you, just to clarify, Eric, are you talking about triggers or are you talking more about behaviors, what you see? I think more of behaviors that you see. Like, so, okay. Um, All right. Yeah. 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 So um, here's some really fun ones. So um, we tell ourselves a big story. That's one of our behaviors. So how many times? Uh, for example, one might say, uh, I'll have time to do that later. So we're procrastinating maybe for one of those big reasons we don't feel like getting into action or completing what we started. So I tell myself the story, I'll get back to that later when I get back to my office about three o'clock and I'll sit right down and I'll do it. And I would would tell myself that story like I believed it. But you know what? When I would challenge it, it was just a story. It was just a story because three o'clock would come along and I wasn't in the mood to do that. So what's what's the solution then for that? um, To stop telling yourself a story and to replace the story. So you replace the story with something different. Um, And that's one thing I cover in my workshop, too, is that if you're telling yourself a story that's um, putting you um, in the mode to procrastinate and to not get things done, it's finding that point you stop and you use that story. And then uh, you might journal it. You might write down, you know, what's the stories I'm telling myself when I'm ready to procrastinate, right? And then you start thinking about what you can say back. You know, I always say, talk back to that voice, talk back to that belief, because more likely than not, it's not true. The the great thing about allowing to procrastinate. The great thing about kind of acknowledging and owning our story Mm -hmm. is that if we don't like the way the story is going, we can mm-hmm. change the narrative and we can write a new ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's those replacement thoughts are your narrative, Eric. They are your new ending, especially if you realize, if you create that awareness that this is, I'm just telling myself stories, you know, I need to, I need to pause and reflect on the accuracy of what I'm saying. So that's one, one behavior. Um You know, another behavior is that black and white, all or nothing thinking or perfectionism Mm -hmm. with procrastination. Is I I am a a recovering perfectionist. (laughs) I am still I am still in recovery. I will probably always be in recovery. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 a struggle. It is a struggle. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and so again, I'm not the first one to say this, but when you're a perfectionist, you know, how much time do I have to give? What is good enough? enough what is good enough for the situation um, mm-hmm. um I, I will talk with uh, clients about what what is most important you know in bucket a what is somewhat important in bucket b and what is you know at the end of the day it really doesn't matter and where can you afford to be a perfectionist is it the things that are most important at the end of the day yeah is good enough okay for that, you know, bucket B, which is, you know, somewhat important. And maybe uh, bucket C is when you just can get around to something, you know, that mm-hmm. you'll do it because it doesn't, you know. We actually had a conversation so today in my in my uh, coaching group about perfectionism. And one of uh, my, my members brought up something that I said on a, on a prior podcast. And that mm-hmm. is that good enough is great. So perfect sucks. Good enough mm-hmm. is great. Yes, yes. Which is so yes. important. So I think it's really acknowledged because when we mm-hmm. think about, you know, where perfection comes in with, with um, procrastination. So mm-hmm. if good enough is like that, what we are viewing as 80% quality, and let's mm-hmm. say that 80% quality is two hours of work. But mm-hmm. to get to 100% quality requires 15 hours of work. Where is the payoff? I mean, that's not right. a good uh a measure of our time Mm -hmm. and what people expect from us really is more Mm -hmm. of that, like 70 to 80%. People don't really expect that hundred percent. It's Uh we are our own harshest critic. It's that Uh fear of people are going to think that we are not good enough. And it has to do with our kind of our self worth. Um, And Uh I think that's one of the really important kind of distinctions um, 
when we're dealing with perfectionism is that, you know, good work and being uh, and having your your work be valued is mm-hmm. different from being worthy as a person. And I think the more that we understand that and understand that, you know, often deep inside, we are thinking that our work has to do with our, our sense of worthiness. And as soon as mm-hmm. we can own that and acknowledge that, mm-hmm. we can begin to change our narrative. Robin, what mm-hmm. I want to do really quickly is take a really quick break so I can uh, continue to outsource all the things that I tend to hyper-focus on, like editing and everything else like that. So we will be right back. And when we come back, I'd like to uh, maybe do a little um, exchange, you and I, of what are we procrastinating on right now? Okay. 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 All right. We will sure. be right back. All right. I bought my plane ticket. My hotel room is booked. I'm registered for the conference. What's left? I have to finish our presentation. I have plenty of time. Wait, no, no, I don't. Okay, don't panic. I have most of it done. I just have to tweak a few things and completely rewrite my introductory story to reflect the latest insights that I've had about that have been swimming around in my head. I'm going to get back to working my presentation in just a moment. In the meantime, if you haven't registered for the conference yet, it's November 12th through the 14th in New Orleans, the big easy. And look, I know some of you might be thinking, I can't afford this conference. It's 240 bucks for the conference. And it's probably going to be at least a couple hundred bucks for airfare unless you drive. And then the hotel, although it could be cheaper if you split it with somebody, I think you can do that on the website. Either way, that's going to be like a couple hundred bucks and, and it could all total up to seven or $800 or maybe even more, but it's not like that supersonic gumball machine that you ordered last year on a whim, by the way, which I think was awesome. This is an investment. You could spend a year reading all the books that have been written by all the speakers who will be at this year's conference, or you can come see them present and talk to them and who knows, maybe even have a drink with them. You could wait until the conference is over and buy the audio afterwards, but let's get real for a moment. What are the chances that you will actually get yourself to sit down and listen to this on your own? I mean, maybe you will. And if you do, great, because I would recommend it. The past audio for past conferences is also on the website, so I would check it out. But seriously, join me at the biggest tribal event for the ADHD community. Go to chad.org. That's C-H-A-D-D dot org. And find out if I finish my presentation in time. Oh, man, I hope no one from the Chad Conference Planning Committee is listening to this. And if you are, I have it all under control. There's nothing to worry about. November 12th to the 14th. Don't wait. Go to chad.org. See you there. It's ADHD Awareness Month trivia time. What do? Stephanie Sarkis, Ari Tuckman, Roberta Olivardia, Terry Matlin, Alan Brown, Rick Green, Melissa Orlov, and Elaine Taylor Klaus all have in common. If you guessed that they've all been featured with me on this podcast, that's one right answer, but that's not the only one. They are also featured speakers at this year's ADHD Awareness Expo. This is an online free expo. Other speakers include Sari Solden, Lori Dupar, David Gwerk, David Noel, Casey Dixon, and others. 26 experts all in one week. And the best part is it's free. And of course, you won't want to miss my session on productivity and vulnerability. My session is scheduled for Thursday, October 29th at 12 p.m. Central Time. There really is no reason you should not register for this right now. It's free. Go to ADHDexpo.com. That's ADHDexpo.com. And I'll see you there. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. 
All right, we are Ooh. back. <laughs> oh, okay. It was a long break, right? <laughs> that was really fast outsourcing your park eric (laughs) it's really funny okay so i I think i just have to share what just happened and if you want to edit it we can but i but we know i'm all about sharing the imperfections so as i is you know right before we get started i i always share that when i um when we take that break i'm gonna tell you we're gonna take a quick break and it's just really really like brief (laughs) And and so it just happened. I think you were like, "Hey, this is a relief that oh now a break." And like, wait, we're back. And it, Robin, you're not the first person who has responded that way. So, like, okay, let's breathe. Okay. okay, all right, yes. So, so let's let's jump in to what what are we procrastinating to do right now? Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. want me to go first, I can certainly make this easier. You you go All first, right. and then I'll compliment you. Let's okay, go. so I have a uh, I have okay. a uh, a contract a W nine that I need to uh, return. I'm presenting in February uh, at the Illinois Association of Parks and Recreation, um, mm. and I have a W nine that that I uh, I need to to reply to and and fill out. Um, mm-hmm. That I've now like added to a new dry erase thing that I have on like above me, and it's like been I've been moving it from week to week. It will probably take me 10 minutes to do, but yeah. like anytime there's like a government tax form, that's mm-hmm. just like, it's so just, uh, yeah, I'm procrastinating on that right now. Yeah. That's no fun. So what will, what do you think will help you out there? The due date. I think it's due tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to love mine then. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so I've been teaching a pilot uh, to middle schoolers in a um, local middle school, Uh, smooth sailing for school success. It's really fun. Um, It's been great. Uh, We're about halfway through. I need to finish the curriculum for the last half of the program. Now, it's not that I don't have it, Eric. It's not that I don't have it because it's all the stuff I've been working with whenever I have a middle school uh, student anyway. Um, But it's just writing up you know, the, what are the three or four key concepts? What is the activity we're going to do? Right. Um, what is, what is the thing I'm going to give them to take home and share with their parents, uh, those kinds of things. And I have to admit that every single time I teach this class, it is about an hour out. And here we are today. It's going to be about an hour out when we're done. And I am going to slide into home base. And I know it's going to be great. And it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> but because it's that story I tell. So you, you asked about the behaviors, the things we see. We will slide into home base because we know we can and we can get by with it you know, and, um, it's really, that's my thing. That's what I'm procrastinating about right now. Okay. I I have a similar one that, um, um, related to the the ADHD rewired coaching and accountability group. So I've been wanting to kind of, uh, uh, create, um, cause I, part of this group where I I give assignments. Right. And Mm -hmm. so like each, each session, I like, I've been finding, I've been reinventing the wheel on these assignments. And so mm-hmm. what I've been doing is now when I post an assignment, I'm creating an, an autoresponder uh, mm-hmm. sequence in my email marketing program in, in Constant mm-hmm. Contact, mm-hmm. So, which takes a little bit longer to do. So I'm not just kind of posting it in, my, in the Facebook group um, yeah. for, uh, for the group. But now what I'm doing, and, and I am, I'm now behind on one week, it seems like each group, I like, I'll do it like for two weeks and then I'll do it for three weeks. Um, so now I'm, but I've been pretty good this time. Mm-hmm. So the idea that and then is next time I don't have to reinvent the wheel. All I have to do is push start on that autoresponder mm-hmm. series. And I once mm-hmm. a week, like everything that I know I want the people in my group to be getting as far as assignments, they just get it and I don't have to think about it anymore. Right. And so right. that comes yeah. to the whole idea of creating significance, which I really like. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, a, a concept that I heard um, from Rory Vaden's book, Procrastinate on Purpose. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with that one? 
No, no. I haven't read that one. I, I'm familiar with Roy, Rory, right? Mm -hmm. But I haven't mm -hmm. read the book. So, yeah. So it's that idea of, you know, spend a little bit more time now so you can, met, you know, multiply your time later. All right. Other, yeah. other uh, procrastination. Uh, um, is it your oh. turn or my turn? Yeah. Let's see here. It's my turn. Let's see. Um, yeah. So my husband and I, we've been really working hard to clear the clutter. Right. Um, and I've learned that if I have a buddy working alongside me, I get so much more done in that regard. And so I asked for help. He's, he was so gracious. It's been a wonderful help. So we get, we, we get going, we get a lot done. Right. And then there's always that surface of little things I have to decide yet what to do with, right? So um, we had to do a lot. I'm, I've raised four kids, you know, they're older now. And so we have a lot of stuff. We've, we've been pulling out and getting ready to get the offload. And that's great. It's looking fabulous. But there's always that little surface of those tiny little things that I found. It's like, I got to find a home. I got to, I got to figure out what I want to do with this. And um, that's a, a an example of having a hard time with the final finish, the final yes. step. You I, I get heard, into it, the momentum. I heard yeah. once that, you know, piles are, are delayed decisions. Yes. Yes. Indecisiveness is one big contributor to procrastination yeah well, when you mentioned stuff like around your house there were a couple of things that i was thinking of and i'm sure i mentioned this on a prior podcast uh, mm -hmm. so i just want to bring up that i still haven't done it um mm -hmm. i have so about two years or so ago i got this really cool picture frame it's like a this like metal like uh, tree structure and at the end of each tree is like a circle picture frame mm -hmm. so the family that was in the picture frame when we bought it in the store is still in the picture frame <laughs> And it's been on my wall for at least two years. No. <laughs> I, I've become very attached to them. You have probably have a whole story around that family by now. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking, right? <laughs> They're relatives by now, right? Very cool. One, okay. one day. I mean, I mean, I'm it's fun. like, you know, when my... We're Jewish and they're this, this family is blonde haired. Uh, blah, blah. It's like, <laughs> they don't seem related, but you know, we can make up a story about it. There's some story there. There is a story <laughs> there, right? <laughs> that sounds like a great blog, Eric. You should make that one a blog. That would be good. That would be something that I would procrastinate about too, is, is it writing a blog? Oh, I don't like to write. Oh, that's that's well, one of the I, stories I tell myself. Yeah, I have some uh, I have some picture frames too. So don't feel so bad. I have I have a stack in my closet of frames I love that I bought that I thought I'm going to put some pictures in here and one day my husband was just asking me, "Okay, well what are we going to do about these frames?" you know, from our uh clean out this weekend. I went, mean, "Oh, I'm going to put something in there. I know I am." So, and I will. Yeah. Yeah. I have to give myself a deadline, I think. I think I had a deadline for that project and it, it came and went. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess it's just like, I don't care enough about it. Like it's, it's, yeah. and it's, it's okay. I, I don't feel ashamed about it. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. one of those things where it's like, it'd be nice if I got around to that, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. to me, it's also sort of funny. So it's, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just the way my, my mindset is. Um, yeah. And the reason I think it's important that we share these stories so people know that like, they're not alone in, in these issues that they were having. It's so there's things big and small. You, when we were talking last week, um, you said that one of your, your biggest challenges in their areas of procrastination also has to do with kind of bringing the, your bigger goals to the day to day stuff. What would you mind talking a little bit about that? Bringing my bigger goals to the day to day stuff. So like your, your bigger planning. Um, and you had to look at, you had to look on your face. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably true. You're like, wait, what? What, what did we talk about? I am. Um, one thing I do really well is plan my day. I've had to learn how to really plan the flow of my day. I hate I hate like at 12 noon, I will do this. And at 3.05, I'll do this, right? But I really plan the rhythm, the sequence of my day based on my time commitments and everything. Um, I think maybe what you're talking about is I have this really, really 
fun um, project I'm going to do as a pilot. I have it all mapped out. I think this might be what we were talking about. And um, and I never quite seem to get around to it. And I use the story of, but I'm so busy and I'm so tired, right? And so um, what I would say, and that is that is true, that is a huge goal for me to get this program out there. Um, and I've been working on it. Uh, but what I, what I would say is that procrastination affects everyone. Uh, with ADD, there's a little bit more of a tendency to procrastinate. Um, we experience it a little bit more uh, acutely. And it's fi figuring out what's going to help you move forward. Like that picture frame, the frames, connecting the frames to something that really is important to us. Like I, uh, I love my family. They are so important to me, watching them grow up, um, being able to see great pictures of them is very important to me. Um, so finding a way to connect the results of getting that job done to something that's extremely important, huge. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, uh, I think as a coach, there's so much, you can only give so much of your time one-on-one -on -one. and mm -hmm. ADD is something where, uh, it's, it's a huge mission for me to make a difference in that arena because of everything I've been through my family, um, you know, the people, it's a huge, huge mission to make a difference. So I have to figure out how to make it on a little bit larger scale. And that's why it's important to me. There's ways to do it. That's mm -hmm. the thing. It's what, if it doesn't work, talking about using what you've learned in the, from the past and the present, I'm um, getting that support you need, getting that um, approach that's really going to work for who you are, how you're wired to get it done. And yeah. Robin, I think that is such a valuable kind of just uh, snapshot of, I think of what you're doing, what I'm doing, what I think a lot of, of, professionals in the ADHD community are doing who have ADHD. It's because we've struggled and we have learned a lot mm -hmm. throughout this journey and mm -hmm. through sharing our stories, you know, mm -hmm. we can, I think this is this feeling of like, how could we not share our stories? Because in doing mm -hmm. so we can help people know that it, it can and does get better. Mm -hmm. And so I think it takes, I think it takes a lot of courage to tell our stories, but to mm -hmm. me, it's, it's, it's a harder thing to not tell the story because, mm -hmm. you know, when I think back to my like, younger self, the, the self before I understood the challenges that I have and I, the first thing that always comes to mind is, man, I wish I knew then what I know now. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, by doing this podcast, by presenting, by by, you know, running a, a chat group, you know, I, it is a, it is a true passion of mine mm -hmm. and it's being able to see those light bulbs go off when I'm talking with people, when I'm presenting to teachers, when I'm presenting to parents and you can just see that. Oh, oh and to yeah. me, that is, that's what keeps me doing this and where mm -hmm. I don't see any end in sight of, of, continue, of stopping sharing this message um, no. I think what both of us are are trying to figure out is how do we share this message to to as many people as possible because mm -hmm. we know that there are so many people. I mean, the thing that boggles my mind, you know, Chad right now is is doing their their one in fifteen million campaign where mm -hmm. you know it's it's this idea that there's um, and this is a low estimate. There's fifteen million people in the U.S. living with ADHD. You know, mm -hmm. four to nine percent of the population. And the thing that boggles my mind is that 85 percent of those people don't know it. Right. You know, Alan Brown That's did a whole a, a TEDx yes. talk on, on that. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, so when people hear or say that, oh, ADHD is over that, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, hmm. Like, is, is there some, is it really, right. Yeah. It's like, it's not a black and white thing. It's like, is there some people who get diagnosed who it's not accurate? Yes. But yeah. way more so are people not getting diagnosed when, mm -hmm. they, when they, when they should be because it's, it's accurate. And what you mentioned too, that women present differently. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's when we know better, we do better. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 ADHD, it's, it's, it's not an excuse. It's an explanation. And then once we understand that, 
we can break mm-hmm. down the, the specific things that we're struggling with, the specific challenges that we're having, whether it's, you know, starting, as I always say on the podcast, starting is the hardest part or procrastination. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so as we are learning from our struggles, we share it with others. And I just think that's, you know, science is important. And, and I think most of us who do this professionally are be, being informed by the research, but mm-hmm. stories have the power to move and have a power to change people's lives. And so that's why I do this podcast and why I share what I do and I, why I ask other people to share their stories because stories mm-hmm. have the power to move. Yeah, that's so wonderful, Eric. It's it's just amazing. And I I can just imagine people are listening to your podcast just going, yes, yes, yes. You know, um, I, uh, I want to just touch on it, just one or two things. Um, you know what? Nobody gets to be perfect. Nobody. Nobody gets to be perfect. And I think um, I have found, and I really believe this to be true, is that when you have ADD or ADHD or whatever you want to call it, um, when you struggle with those executive functioning um, challenges over and over again, um, it really helps. It helps when you when you know this, when you can see through this lens, when you can really understand what they're going through. And I share my stories with my clients. So I nobody gets to be perfect. That's what I tell them. And, um, you know, odds are I've been through everything you've been through. Right. And the big picture, the big message here is there is hope. There is something different and that no excuse, it is an explanation is so important. I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, my gosh, I didn't get diagnosed till I was 50. I was reading someone um, who was talking about being diagnosed at 65 or 70 and yet still saying, okay, about face. Now I understand what can I do? And that is that is my hope for everyone out there. When ADD is maybe something they're thinking about or they suspect or they find out, there is hope. There is an about face. There is an opportunity, a big opportunity. And there's a big opportunity just around the corner in New Orleans. So I know that you are going to be yes. at the chat conference. Yes. I'm I'm yes. really excited about it. Have, Me too. Have, have you booked all your airfare and hotel and everything? Yes. No procrastination there. Got the hotel, the air, know what I'm doing. Yes. Have you finished um, your presentation? Most of the presentation. I know you were talking about tweaking it a little bit. And there was that piece of me going, oh, maybe, maybe I'll tweak mine a little bit too. So I think I'm making the slides a little bit more vibrant, you know, but. So um, we're recording this on October 19th and my presentation is still not done. So it's, you know, it's, I, I, cause I'm reform formulating some of the things that I'm, pre- the way I'm presenting it, it's, uh-huh. it, it will be done. You know, it, it's, yes. some of this is just kind of moving some things around and introducing some new stories. Um, mm-hmm. But it is, it's, you know, I, this will be my second time presenting at Chad. This will be my sixth Chad conference. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if, if you want to I mean, we're talking about learning, growing, and connecting. Mm-hmm. There is nothing like it at a chat mm-hmm. conference. Yes. I, I sat in on yours last year, Eric. It was awesome. Just awesome. You had everybody spellbound. So um, you rock. Thank and you. I know it's going to be great. Um, yes. And I just, I have so much excitement for Chad. I, I think that sometimes we feel we're out there alone as individuals with ADD. Um, we struggle with understanding what to do. We struggle with decisions sometimes about what to do. Uh, We feel like we can't talk a whole lot about it. Um, It's getting better now. Um, People are really really a little bit more outright about their diagnosis as the stigma uh, gets chipped away at uh, so that it's not so, um, oh, I don't know, threatening to feel like you can open up 
mm-hmm. and really share what you're going through. Um, but this is a great time. You're with your tribe. You're with your peeps. You you are learning. You are growing. You are feeling that hope and that encouragement. And uh, hopefully from Chad walking away with the enthusiasm that you need to do something um, to make a difference for yourself, for the one you love. Um, and you feel empowered. So, yeah. Robin, yeah. Th- I just want to thank you so much for, for sharing your story and some of the, the tips and strategies that you shared with us. Will you do me a favor and share with the ADHD Rewired listeners where people can learn more about you and where they can contact yeah. you if they would like to reach out to you? Oh, sure. And thank you for having me here, Eric. It's just been a pleasure. And um, I love your show. Uh, So if you want to reach out and connect with me, you can find me online. And my website is www.livingwellwithadhd.com. So livingwellwithadhd.com. Or you can Google my name, Robin Nordmeyer, N-O-R-D-M-E-Y-E-R. But I'm out there. And um, I have... uh, definitely things that I am doing to help others move along, get things done. I have a program, get it done. um, That's piloting right now. That's doing really well. So I'll be doing it again, but um, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. It's just been fun. Robin, thank you so much for sharing your story and I will see you in New Orleans. It sounds great. I can't wait. It'll be fun. Thanks, Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewire.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.